All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our today's episode, the, the third episode of our second season, uh, titled This is the Way, Sensory Guidance in Foraging. Uh, this is, so to speak, our halftime show of this season. And uh, unfortunately, we, uh, due to unforeseen uh, circumstances, we only have one speaker today, uh, which is Paulina, Dr. Paulina Fleischmann. And uh, we will basically have the, the usual setup of, of our episodes, which is uh, we have a short introduction, then we have the talk of the speaker, and then afterwards we have a, a Q&A directly related to the talk, and then we kind of open up uh, to a more broader uh, discussion uh, related to the topic of today's episode. And uh, yeah, with that, I will give it over to uh, Rory, who will do the introduction of Paulina. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're very honored to welcome uh, our speaker for today, Dr. Paulina mm -hmm. Fleischmann, uh, who's a real expert on the foraging and navigational behavior of ants. Um, Paulina began her journey in science with a bachelor's degree in philosophy and biology at hum Humboldt University Berlin. Um, she graduated there in 2010 with a thesis on animal ethics under the supervision of Professor Kirsten Meyer. Uh, she stayed in Berlin for her master's studies, um, this time at the Free University of Berlin, studying um, neurobiology and behavior from 2010. And here she made her first contribution to the field of foraging, studying inter-individual differences uh, in decision-making in nectarivorous bats for her master's thesis in collaboration with Professor York Winter from Humboldt University. Uh, her master's studies also took her to Trondheim, Norway for an Erasmus placement. Uh, in 2013, Paulina moved to Würzburg to begin her PhD at Julius Maximilian University on her thesis, Starting Foraging Life, Early Calibration and Daily Use of the Navigational System in Katur Glyphus Ants, under the joint supervision of Professor Wolfgang Grossler uh, and Professor Rudiger Werner. During this position, she published extensively on the sensory dynamics and neuronal underpinnings of ant navigation and foraging, uh, and won the Biocenter Science Award for outstanding research achievements during her PhD project uh, when she graduated in 2018. This work led her to a postdoc position at the University of Würzburg, uh, studying the dynamics of geomagnetic and celestial compass cues in ant foraging at the start of 2019. Um, her stellar work on the topic saw her win the Young Investigator Award uh, 2020 from the International Society of Neuroethology um, and uses behavioral and neurobiological experiments in the field and lab to investigate the compass systems used in path integration in ants. So, yeah, without further ado, I hand over to Paulina. Thanks. Um... I will now share my screen. Um, here. So just now the whole um, screen. And then you have to tell me whether you can see the presentation in presentation mode, yes. mode now. Okay. We can see Good. it. Perfect. OK, then I will just start. Um, Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to present today parts um, of my research in the framework of the Future of Foraging seminar. And um, today I will talk about how um, cataclysmic ants become successful foragers. And um, since I assume that there are some people who, who are aware of cataclysmic ants and others are not, I will start with a short introduction about my um, study species. So here you can see a photo of one of my um, experimental animals. And as you can see, it's a really beautiful animal. But more importantly, these ants are um, famous for their navigational capacities. And um, this will be the main focus of the talk, um, how, how they navigate. And before, I just want to highlight that um, cataclysmic ants are, of course, also eusocial insects, which means that they live together in one colony. 
and um, that they have an age-related division of labor. So in the beginning of their life, <clears throat> they perform indoor tasks like taking care for the brood and the queen, cleaning the nest and digging new tunnels. And that's also the time when they are first exposed to the outside world. Um, so they see the sun for the first time. And um, this triggers also that they start to um, become foragers. And during this transition phase, they perform learning works. Um, and um, the, the ultimate goal is to become a forager to search for food for the colony and um, yeah, to, to provide everything the colony needs. Um, in the first part, we will now focus on the foragers and later on we will um, focus on the naive ants at the beginning of their foraging career. So research on cataclysis ants has been performed since the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> and mainly with foragers. They are solitary central place foragers, which mean that they search for food alone in the surroundings, and they need um, a lot of uh, cues in order to return to the nest. And um, Rudi Gavina calls this a navigational toolkit. The most important component is path integration. Path integration means that the animal needs to keep track of the directions and distances traveled um, during the outbound run in order to return in a straight line. Today, we know that um, the ants determine the directions by using celestial cues, for example, the position of the sun or the UV polarization pattern, and they me measure the distances by integrating um, their steps. Here you see a textbook example of a foraging trip of a desert ant. <clears throat> the ant is leaving the nest indicated by the N until finding a food item up here, and then she returns in a straight line. The longest recorded um, foraging trip of a cataclysis ant was more than 350 meters away from the nest, covering over a kilometer. So it's really um, a long trip for such a tiny animal. In addition to path integration, these ants use landmarks, which are um, often visual landmarks like the panorama around the nest entrance or landmarks um, along a route. But it might also be olfactory cues or under um, artificial um, conditions in, in experiments, vibrational or magnetic cues. In case an ant is lost, they pursue a systematic search. Um, in order to retain, re to return safe and sound to the nest. And um, these navigational capacities are under, um, underlined and enabled by a powerful brain. For all these reasons, cataclysis ants are famous experimental models to study insect navigation. And when I started my PhD 2013 um, at the University of Würzburg under the supervision of Wolfgang and Rüdiger, we ask the question, how do they learn to navigate? And the short answer is, they perform learning works. And during my PhD, I investigate, investigated structure and function of these learning works. So um, I will summarize some of this work to, in order to give you enough background to understand what um, I'm doing now. <clears throat> so if we come back to this cartoon, we will now focus on the transition phase between outdoor and, and um, uh, indoor phase. So the first goal of my PhD thesis was to um, compare uh, the structures of different learning works performed by different species. And actually, learning works are similar across species. Um, <clears throat> for example, here you can see the learning works uh, in a subsequent manner of um, the Tunisian Cataclysis fortis, which inhabits um, a Tunisian salt pan. And as you can um, see, the, the, the different walks are um, directed into different sectors around the nest entrance. And that's true for almost all ant species, um, different Cataclysis species, but also more distantly related um, ants, like for example, the Australian desert ants or the Australian bull ants. And what's important about these learning walks is that they never forage during learning walks, so they don't bring back any food items. 
they return to the nest after finishing a learning work and with increasing experience, the animals move further away and stay outside the nest for longer times. Um, after uh, understanding the principal characteristics, we, um, we wanted to focus on um, the fine structure of specific elements. And here in this example, you can see that the learning walks include turns. This learning work was painted with pen and paper. And of course, in order to, to understand the fine structure of these um, elements, we need a different um, recording technique. So we performed um, high-speed video um, recordings. And here you can see our um, field sites on the left in Tunisia in the salt pen and on the right in the pine forest in Greece. The setup was the same and actually also the observer is the same, it's, it's Robin who did his bachelor and master thesis with me, <clears throat> and he's now soon to finish his PhD. And um, after recording the ants, we can digitize the paths. And um, here you see one example of such a learning work. The animal is leaving the nest um, and then returns to the nest, which is indicated by the star. And during the learning work, performs several turns. Walls are little walked circles, whereas pirouettes are tight turns about the ant's body axis. And during the longer stopping phase, um, the ant gazes back towards the nest entrance. And that's important because we assume that they memorize um, their way back home for foraging later on. Um, Usually, we plot our data in circular diagrams, which you can see on the right, and I explain it to you because it will occur several times during the talk. So, um, the, the, in gray, you can see the data, which are the gaze directions during the longest stopping phases of pirouettes, and it's like a typical bar histogram just in a circle. And in red, you see the statistics. Um, if the arrow exceeds the circle, it means the data is directed. In that case, we can calculate the confidence interval. And if the goal lies between the limits, it means that data is directed towards the goal. So in that case, we can say the ants gaze back to the nest entrance. However, you probably want to see the behavior and it's easily observable, so I brought a video. We put the camera behind the nest entrance and you can see that the ants are running off. And now the one on the top will make a pirouette back to the nest entrance. And here's the second one gazing back and again gazing back and then running off. So um, it's a clearly observable um, behavior, which enables us to have a readout where the ants expect their nest entrance. And um, importantly, not only the Cataclyphus nodus, which you have seen in the video, but also other Cataclyphus species inhabiting a cluttered environment perform this behavior. In contrast, the ones in Tunisia, um, in the salt pan without landmarks, don't perform any pirates. So you can see this in this cartoon. Um, and that's why we focused in subsequent studies on, on the um, Cataclyphus nodus increase. Um, one important question is which reference system the ant uses to gaze back to the nest entrance. In this picture, you see this ant, but what you probably cannot see is that here is a nest entrance, which is a tiny hole in the ground, and it's also invisible from the ant's perspective. So the ant needs a reference system to align the gaze directions. And um, <clears throat> we performed an experiment which was Robin's master thesis, where we um, wanted to disturb this behavior or um, we wanted to hinder that the ants gaze back to the nest entrance by manipulating the celestial cues. Since cataclysmic foragers use celestial cues during foraging for path integration, we assumed that um, during uh, the initial learning walks, they also use celestial cues. However, no matter what we put above the nest entrance, so that's the natural condition, the control condition, but even um, if we put up um, uh, different filters and um, sunshades, the ants always look back to the nest entrance. And that, that was a 
big surprise for us um, because it means that they use other cues than the celestial cues to give back to the nest entrance. Um, we discussed other possible cues. So first of all, they might use landmarks, but they, lead, they need to be learned themselves. So that's not an option. They could use olfactory cues. However, olfactory cues are only wind upwards helpful. They could use an intrinsic mechanism, which is um, highly prone to cumulative errors. And that may be fatal as foragers later on if you take snapshots into the slightly wrong direction. The last option we took into consideration was a geomagnetic field. And the geomagnetic field has two advantages. One is that it's in principle already available in the nest. So the ants could kind of use the system they already know before going out for the first time. And we knew that Cataclysis nodus use magnetic cues as landmarks in experimental conditions. And um, yeah, that's indeed what's happening. And I will now show you how we figured out that they indeed use the geomagnetic field. So um, at the end of the summer, at the end of the field season, when we performed all the experiments with the celestial filters, we just decided to build um, a spiral, um, an electromagnetic spiral, in order to mix up the geomagnetic field. So both the magnetic field strengths and the um, uh, directions of the field lines were completely mixed up. And um, when the spiral was off, the ants gazed back to the nest. But when we switched it on, gaze directions were randomly distributed. And that mean, meant that we had the first proof that Cataclysis indeed uses the um, geomagnetic field to align the gaze directions. And the next summer, we came back with a more sophisticated um, experimental setup, a Helmholtz coil. And the, the huge advantage of a Helmholtz coil is that you can um, manipulate the magnetic field in a more controlled manner. Um, the field is most homogeneous in the middle. So we had to train the ants to walk via a tunnel from the natural nest entrance on our experimental platform where we could manipulate the field and record um, the animals. And the first thing we did was that we eliminated the horizontal component. And as you can see here, before the um, coil was switched on, animals gazed back. But when the horizontal component was eliminated, gaze directions were randomly distributed. In contrast, if we strengthened the field, the animals gazed back towards the nest entrance before and after um, the coil was switched on. So that, that was um, very good for our hypothesis. And we decided to perform another experiment where we um, turned or rotated the magnetic field in a way that if the ants use it as a reference system, also the position of the nest entrance should be indicated into a different um, direction. Here's another video. I will show it to you. It's the top view of our experimental platform. There's a test stand next to the nest entrance, and it's performing a learning walk with pirouettes. It gazes back towards the nest entrance. We then switch on the coil so that the horizontal component is rotated by 180 degrees. And if the ant uses this, the fictive nest entrance is positioned now in the opposite direction. Continues its learning walk and gazes back towards the new position. And um, that was really cool. And I'm sorry, I don't know why it starts the video again. Um, and um, here you can see the data. We had three different um, manipulations. 180 degrees, which you have seen in the video, and plus and minus 90 degree. And before the coil was switched on, animals always gaze back towards the nest entrance in the platform. Afterwards, um, the gaze directions relative to the nest entrance were randomly distributed, but they were directed towards the fictive nest entrance position if we calculate the same data relative to the fictive nest entrance position. So with these experiments, we could prove that um, cataclysis ants 
use the magnetic field as a reference reference system for path integration during initial learning works. That's that's great, and that opened up many um, questions, um, which which can be summarized under the title magnetic reception and catechesis. And I, um, my aim is to to answer these questions. Um, in, in the future, or also in my ongoing research projects, but most of them are still open and um, I will show you where we stand. So one of the most important questions is, of course, what are the characteristics of the ANS magnetic compass? Then where are the magnetoreceptors located and how is compass information integrated in the brain for navigation? And why do the ANS switch from a magnetic to a celestial compass for path integration? Since we are now going deeper into the magnetic sense, I will give you some background about the magnetic field. Um, most um, uh, probably you are aware that there is um, the characteristic of polarity because if you use a compass, it points towards north and also animals could use this characteristic to orientate. But there are other features of the magnetic field like the inclination, which is defined by the angle of the magnetic field lines on the surface of the globe, and also the intensity, um, which will rise over the globe from the poles towards the equator, um, which, which might be used by animals using the magnetic field. And so, as I said, the um, first important question is whether a compass of um, animals is polarity sensitive or an inclination compass. And here you can see a cartoon where the magnetic field is indicated by the black arrow. It has a component, a vertical and a horizontal component, and north is to the left. So the handheld compass and a bird, which is um, an example of an animal using an inclination compass, both um, look to the left, and also our hand looks to the left. If we now turn the horizontal component with the Helmholtz coil, it means that we change both polarity and inclination of the magnetic field so that in any case, if they use um, a magnetic field, they will turn to the other side. However, if we um, <clears throat> manipulate the vertical component alone or the vertical component together with the horizontal component, we can um, change uh, the um, polarity and the inclination independent from each other. And this will tell us whether it's a polarity or inclination sensitive compass. So what we did is that um, we built a new setup, a 3D Helmholtz coil, which I got at the beginning of my postdoc project. And then we wanted to go to Greece, but due to the pandemic, due to Corona, that was not possible in the summer of 2020. And instead, we stayed in Würzburg and performed our field season in the garden of the university, where we um, set up uh, the coil and the cameras and then used the lab colony to perform our experiments. There are two important differences between the experiments in Würzburg and in Greece. First, the experimental platform did not allow to um, leave the animals, so they had to stay on it because they, they live in the lab. And we used foragers with unknown former experiences. So we didn't know how old they were. And um, <clears throat> we, we performed the experiment I just described. So we rotated the horizontal components, the vertical component, or the complete, ma complete magnetic field. And before we switched on the coil, the animals always gazed back to the nest entrance. However, um, they did not look back to the fictive nest entrance position after we switched um, on the coil, but to our surprise, they um, gazed back towards the nest entrance um, almost in all conditions. And that means that the cataclysis foragers we used in Würzburg did not use the magnetic field to align their gaze directions. And the question is whether it was the lab conditions or the former experiments. And, um, so far, what I have shown you is that during initial learning works, they use the geomagnetic field, and during foraging, they use celestial cues. 
but actually we change two different things here. So we have um, ants with different experiences and different tasks. And so one key to answer this question or this puzzle is to have a closer look at relearning works performed by foragers. So um, ants perform relearning works that had, has been go, known for several years when the panorama has been changed or also when they visit a new feeder. And um, what, what we did is that we monitored the whole um, life of, of, of um, ants from the beginning to the end. And for that, we marked them um, with individual codes. So um, before the experiment started, we marked all four ages outside the nest. And then the new ants, which appeared, were marked individually so um, that we could record the life history of um, the uh, individual ants. And then when we had enough foragers, we triggered relearning walks with a landmark next to the nest entrance and recorded the relearning walks in order to compare them. And here you can see how it looks like when, when an ant is performing a relearning walk. And what you may notice immediately is that it's spiral shaped and does not guide the ant back to the nest entrance. So foragers always leave to pursue a foraging trip when they perform a relearning walk in contrast to new ants which return to the nest. And um, also the pattern or the structure of the learning work is slightly different. In relearning works, we have observed something which we call meandering. And we didn't see any walls, but only pirouettes. And since the pirouettes are very um, uh, um, reliable readout, we continue to work with the pirouettes of foragers. And the first interesting feature is that, as I told you before, um, the, the, sorry, the pirouettes of the naive ants are directed towards the nest, but those of the foragers are not. So the gaze directions are randomly distributed if you analyze them relative to the nest. Um, and uh, nevertheless, we, we also performed a magnetic manipulation experiment with our foragers. And um, we um, had two different setups. First one was similar to, to the um, one in the free field or next to the nest entrance, where we put up one single landmark. And um, as in the free field, the foragers did not gaze back to the nest entrance during the periods. However, if we change the complete panorama, they gaze back to the nest entrance. If we now switch on the um, coil, interestingly, the foragers gaze back towards the nest entrance, but not to the fictive nest entrance position. That means that foragers do not use the magnetic field to align their gaze directions, but they must rely on something else. But they can still sense that something happened because, um, as you can see in the um, one single landmark experiment, um, there is a change in behavior from randomly distributed gaze directions to gazing back towards the nest. And what's important also for us now is that foragers and new ants use different compass systems. So um, what we want to do, or what we also did, is to perform the experiments with new ants in the natural habitat. And actually, we did it last um, summer, but the data analysis has not been finished, and I cannot show you any um, data about that at the moment. Um, before I stop, I have some take-home messages for you. Um, the first one is that in my opinion, cataclysmic ants are really impressive navigators, and I'm happy to discuss um, also other aspects I did not cover in my talk with you. The gaze is back to the nest as an ideal behavior readout <coughs> for, for the research questions of, of us. And um, it's important to note that the geomagnetic field is the res reference system during initial learning works but we don't know what's, what's going on later on in the life of the foragers. And um, um, as, as I have explained, they seem to switch um, 
on which compass systems they rely for navigation. So um, now I'm at the end and I would like to thank all the people and institutions which make my research possible. First of all, of course, um, my supervisors, Wolfgang Rösler and Rudiger Wiener, who supported me um, during my PhD. And now I'm still in Wolfgang's lab as a postdoc. And um, he, as well as Rudiger, continues to, to, to support um, yeah, my projects. Robin is a great uh, companion for the field seasons, and we have a lot of inspiring discussions. Valentin helps with the physics behind the experiments and Jochen introduced um, to us how, how we can analyze it, the learning walks and um, we had many fruitful discussions. I also want to thank the National Park in Greece where we perform our experiments, the field teams, the Zoology 2 department at the University of Würzburg, as well as the funding agencies. Every, everyone makes yeah, my research possible. And I want to thank you for your attention and I look forward to discuss these topics with you. I think I will just switch off. Thank you very Thanks. much, Paulina. This was a great talk. Uh, I just invited uh, Rory back to the screen. Great. Okay, he's here. Um, while we're waiting, so everyone can obviously ask a question now to uh, Paulina through our ask a question feature. Uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really amazed by the uh, stereotypy of like different species uh, in Cataglyphus as well as other um, and species um, to have like very similar uh, learning walks, so to speak, like similar characteristics of it. I was just wondering, um, so you said that these learning walks uh, never involve any kind of like food foraging itself, um, but they always return back to home. Is it really that it's like 100% success rate or are there some examples of where uh, and end is like just lost somehow and starts, I guess they start searching around to find the nest entrance in the end or? Yeah, okay, I think there are like two parts of your question. So mm -hmm. first of all, of course, you will find some crazy ants which will bring home food items when, for example, a big one meets a tiny one who's carrying okay. something and she just takes it off the other one. But actually, we also tried to introduce some food items next to the nest entrance and the ants um, which are performing the learning walks usually don't take them home. So if you have an experienced foragers finding a food item 10 centimeter next to the next nest entrance, they are very happy because they didn't have to walk far away and bring it home immediately. Whereas the new ants, they just ignore it usually. But of course, you will have um counter examples the other question is whether you can um whether they sometimes have to search and of course that also happens for example if there's wind and the um learning walk and is um uh, blown to the side um it cannot fully trust the path integrator anymore and then it will search and also with our experiments where we have the platform and then turn the magnetic field the ants um, often fell off the table and then they have to search. And that's something which works from the very beginning on, which makes sense because they need to find back. So um, they are really, they, they, they look for the nest until they die, I guess. Um, but sometimes also other ants might help them. So if the ant is lost and gets tired, well, uh, it's in danger of uh, overheating, other ants might carry them home. So there's an emergency transport system, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> this is amazing. OK, we, we do have a question in from Axel Brockmann. And he asks, uh, do you think that the ants use uh, the magnetic sense in the nest? And this might be a reason why they use that system in their first learning walks outside. Yeah, that's, that's what I um, kind of mentioned that it might be helpful that they already know the magnetic field from the inside. 
there are some studies in Hymenoptera suggesting that um, they can use it in darkness um, in different um, ant species and also in bumblebees. I haven't seen a study so far which, um, which is completely convincing in my opinion. Um, and and uh, the, the problem with cataclyphus is that the readout only functions when they are outside the nest. So we, we are really um, linked to the natural behavior of performing learning walks, but we are also trying to think about something which one could use as a behavioral readout in darkness to figure out whether they use it inside. But since we don't know what one could use, um, we at the moment have to rely on the new ants and, and um, working with the young ants has some disadvantages. As I mentioned, for example, we don't have them in the lab, but we have to go in the free field. And um, we hope that we could use foragers, but as I have told you, foragers don't rely in the same manner on the magnetic field as do um, naive ants. So maybe, maybe they use it in the darkness, but we don't know yet. Thanks for that. Um, I also have a, um, a question. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the kind of hypothesis, hypothesized functions for these learning walks, actually. Like, um, I could imagine that um, there are many different, uh, you know, things that the ant could be kind of training on um, in these early in these early excursions like is it to do with um, kind of scoping out the environment or calibrating a bit their navigational um, abilities or just getting stronger I wasn't exactly sure like if that if, if, the, if the specific um, function of, of these learning walks has been elucidated yeah yeah that's a great and very broad <laughs> um, question. Um, so in my PhD, I mainly focused also on um, landmark learning. And um, we could show that, for example, the animals need both enough um, time and enough space in order to make use of um, landmark information. So if you restrict the um, time, uh, the, the, how often they can go out, or um, the, the space around the nest entrance, they cannot use the landmarks during foraging. Um, so I, I have um, one study with uh, Tunisian ants and another one with the Greek ones, which um, uh, shed light on these different um, uh, aspects. <clears throat> so, so that's um, really important to, to acquire information about the landmarks. Um, what we also investigated, and that was um, a study which we just published um, two months ago, and it was a pity that I had to, to um, put it out of the talk, but for time reasons, is the calibration of the, um, of the celestial compass. Because as you know, the sun and um, also the related UV polarization pattern, it moves um, over the day and it um, moves differently depending on where you are on, on Earth and also um, depending on season. So it cannot be in a, innately known how the function as the so-called solar ephemeris is done. And it has been known for several decades almost that um, the, the ants and also honeybees and so on, they can compensate for the movement of the sun. The question is how they do it. Um, and what we could show in the study I just mentioned is that we um, uh, had uh, different experimental groups. Some performed learning walks, some were just um, exposed to the sensory cues and um, the different filter systems. And only when the ants um, perform um, learning walks under a moving polarization or um, yeah, a moving polarization pattern, we can induce learning depending learning dependent synaptic plasticity. So that's um, really interesting. And of course, what we would love to do is to bring together the neurobiological results with the behavioral testing. But that will be difficult because in Greece, you always have huge landmarks. And it's really difficult to find an experiment where you don't have any landmarks 
available, so they just rely on the celestial cues. But we are trying to figure that out. Mm. Yeah. So it, I'm, I'm right. Am I right in thinking that? <clears throat> so you, you you study um, the same species of ant in both Greece and Tunisia. Did you say? Or yeah, it's the same genus. So it's uh, all species. all cataclysmus ants. Um, right. In uh, Tunisia, the salt pine ant is kind of special, and there is a um, another cataclysmus species which is really um, uh, almost the same as in Greece. Um, but in, then they also live in cluttered environments in Tunisia. So if you want to compare the salt pen and you don't have an equivalent increase because they are so highly adapted to the environment of the salt pen. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. Do, do you know, um, have there been any um, like comparative studies in terms of like brain structure between the, the ants that live in these two different environments? Yeah, there are some studies um, mainly done by um, Wolfgang Rösler's lab, and uh, I think I only have one or two in mind, which, which were from other um, places. Um, and the, in, in general, the cataclysmus brain seems to be quite preserved, but there are, of course, also differences. So. Um, one one of the um, one of my colleagues um, published, I think, two years ago or one year ago, the um, cataclysmus brain atlas, and there you can find many links um, to uh, how um, specific it is to cataclysmus nodos, or whether it's typical for uh, cataclysmus uh, ants, or typical for ants, or typical for hymenoptera. So. That does lead me to one more kind of a slightly more broad question that I was uh, quite interested um, to, to, to know. So um, as, as someone who has a bit of a handle on um, kind of the ants with a um, flavor of neuroscience, I was wondering, so I'm a, like a Drosophilist myself. And obviously from our side, we have a lot of, um, you know, genetic tools and, and um, you know, uh, some fancy tricks you can do with the neuroscience, but perhaps like with a slightly less um, um, uh, rich behavioral repertoire. I was just wondering, from your opinion, like what does the future of kind of neuroscience in uh, an organism such as ants um, look like? Like, are they um, how 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 are um, developments um, in things such as like image uh, neuro, uh, neuronal imaging and um, things like that from someone who doesn't know so much about this this topic but what, what? so so yeah. so i would uh, consider myself also as a neuroscientist of course a neuroisologist with which has uh, who has a huge um, background in in um, field uh, experimental um, field biology but still i think um, the connection of behavior and neuronal basis is the key for neuroscience. Um, and uh, of course, we will, I, I don't think it will be easy to reach the same level as in prosophila, because um, ants are so different from their lifestyle. I, I mentioned in the beginning that they have this youth social um, uh, lifestyle, which means that only the queen and the males get offspring, um, which also means that you cannot um, use all the genetic tools because you always have to manipulate the whole colony and it takes a lot of time or and a lot of animals to, to get to the point um, it's just not feasible. Besides that, it's at the moment also not possible to rear the ants in the lab. So we, we need animals from the wild. Um, imaging might be a better option, but still it's quite hard compared to Drosophila. So already electrophysiology is not that easy with ants. And um, I, I really hope that it will be possible soon. And with soon, I mean, this in my research career, but because there are so many questions which would be um, great to be answered, but um, it, it will be um, difficult. So um, 
for the first step of my postdoc, I decided to stick to the <clears throat> neuroanatomical um, questions because we had enough um, things which could be done with techniques we, we know. But um, in order to, to answer all the questions I outlined, of course, we will need to go on different levels. I'm just not sure 100% how we will do that. Yeah. Great, thanks. I do have a, a little bit more broader question, maybe related to the sensory guidance part of our topic today. Um, I was just wondering, it, it really seems that there's some sort of separation, so to speak, between the uh, magnetic cues and the celestial cues that the ants will use at different phases of, of their foraging lives, so to speak, although obviously you have, like, it's probably difficult to really assess how much of the magnetic cues might be used during the foraging excursions. Um, but do you have any um, ideas of how to potentially, uh, yeah, attack this question uh, uh, in the field? And uh, also, do you have any idea maybe as to why uh, these two senses are used in a fairly separated way um, comparing the learning walks to the foraging excursions? Um. I, I think that's the most puzzling thing because uh, or at least when you look at the problem, you will, could guess that um, the ants should stick to the magnetic field. They have it from the beginning on and it stays there. I mean, it's not disappearing when they go outside. And we are discussing this question a lot. Um, I think there are several possibilities, but I have no idea whether they are right. So it could be that the magnetic sense is kind of slow and foragers get really fast, also due to the heat. So it might be the case that they just don't have the time to make use of the magnetic field. The learning walks are much slower than the foraging trips. It could be that it's too energy consuming, kind of, um, that um, they kind of uh, want to, 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 to use um, the sense only if there's no other option. <clears throat> and um, the moment they have other possibilities, they, they switch. And um, what is also a hypothesis we are trying to um, follow up at the moment, and I also didn't have time to talk about that more, is um, it could also be that the magnetic sense is in a organ or part of the body which is needed for other um, tasks during foraging. So for example, uh, one hypothesis we have is that um, the ants use the antennae for sensing the magnetic field because in the antennae is um, the Johnston organ, which is used to sense, for example, gravity or wind. And this could also be used um, to detect the magnetic field. But of course, during foraging, they also need the antenna to smell um, the food and also to, to monitor the wind direction. So maybe the, the antenna are just busy doing other stuff and they cannot um, use it. Um, and yeah, these, these are the ideas we have in mind. I have no idea what might be true, but um, yeah, that's what we try to, to follow up. <laughs> Thanks. So we have one more uh, question from the audience from Suma Chinta. Uh, do all N species also use magnetic and celestial cues along with olfactory cues? If yes, why is an end, end mill formed, um, which is an, a phenomenon in which a group of army ants are separated from the main foraging party, lose the pheromone track and begin to follow each other, forming this continuous Early uh, rotating circle known as the death spiral, and they will eventually die of exhaustion. Yeah, uh, I think there is a huge difference between the prey pheromone following ants and the desert ants. Um, as I said in the beginning, desert ants are solitary central place foragers, which is um, quite a niche in, 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 in ant uh, um, foraging. 
Um, <clears throat> but they cannot use tray pheromones because the wind and the heat in the desert was dis would disturb immediately the trails. And I think there are examples of tray following ants which can also use celestial cues and um, for sure they also use landmarks. For example, wood ants, they rely on um, trails and, uh, um, and also landmarks. I'm not so familiar with army ants, but I think the more they rely on trail pheromones and disregard other cues, the less um, they can rescue themselves. And army ants are really huge colonies. So it's, if you have a colony of army ants, it's a massive amount of animals. And in, for example, the Tunisian salt plants, there are only several hundred animals per colony. So one ant is much more um, valuable for the colony than um, in, in these immense colonies. So I, I guess they just di distribute the focus differently. And um, that's why you can trick them by letting them run in spirals until they die. Highly interesting behavior. Okay, I think with that, uh, we can uh, end our um, episode here. Um, just to let you know, on the 10th of May, we have our fourth episode, uh, which will feature David Barak and uh, Thommy Hills. And it's about alternative approaches to foraging. And I uh, yeah, hope to see you all there. And again, thank you, uh, Paulina, for your time and your talk. It was really exciting to hear about uh, learning walks in, in ants. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.